Right, well I'm Eric, as you probably know, and I work here as a marshman for the broad, sorry. The last day today, uh, I've just brought a few marsh tools that I do a lot of talks with a lot of these old marsh tools, the old traditional tools of uh, marshman years ago mainly, but I still love them because they're well made and they were practical tools years ago, they were things that people used uh, quite regular going back even when I first started. But my main job really has been cutting reed in the winter, <coughs> cutting sedge in the summer, done lots and lots of talks this last four or five years, probably more than I actually been cutting reed and sedge, but that's the way life is. Anyhow, I'll just run through this. I think you're on the generation game. <laughs> Here we go, look. This one has been tied and tied and tied, but basically it's like that, in that little hole, hook up, as I say, this is very clean. You're getting all the grass out and bits and pieces, but, uh, and as I say, this will be a bit small, but, how you try a reed. And when you think, as I say, you're in water, ice, snow, and the purpose of the board, down on the board, look, break in the side, pick up your string around the bundle, hopefully. And as I say, it's a little bit small this one now because it's been cleaned so many times. So I can get the string through. Right. Right. I should have got a good string. Right. Stick it around. Knock it down. Pull it tight. And actually that should be twice as big. But that's the principle of tying reed. So that's a winter crop. And then we've got another crop that we cut on the marsh, which is sedge. Who's plant the sedge? Sedge. It's cut through the summer period, about now, as you see some done down there. Uh, probably more sought after than actually the reed at the moment. Because as I say, they do import reed from Poland, Turkey, Hungary. But sedge, at the moment, to my knowledge, they don't import it. This takes three to four years to grow. And I think sedge grow in old peat diggings, where they dug up the peat deeper. Very, very sharp. Uh, to get a little idea, two years ago, I cut a thousand bundles to re-reach Howe Hill. I think this lasts in the region of 20, 25 years. So you probably want three reaches to one thatch. But this thing, when I first come to Howe Hill, was the thing that was mostly used by the marshmen. This was the thing that I had to learn. You bought, you bought very little of this. This was the stick that cut in the marsh, an old alder. You leave a bit of weight on that end to cut the bones that end. You put this big hoop on here called the boil and the pricker. Theoretically, when you mole reed, as you swing the side, the reed come along the blade, it cuts, it cuts, it hits the boil, it catches the pricker and it gathers it and it brings it all round and stand up on the reed's nut cut. So that's a little catcher. And whatever you cut with the side, it cuts very, very clean. A lovely machine thing really to use that weed in the dike. Another very basic tool again. I mean they're only basic tools, but a lot of these old things were the marshman's and he would he would treasure these. These would be his in his shed and these would be things that would naturally be used. And I know the old marshman previously who actually taught me, he had a felon axe. You wouldn't allow to touch his axe. If you took the edge off that boy, you got a real rollicking. And they would treasure these old things. They may not look much, but that's when the, for, for pulling the weed out of the dike when you cut it onto the bank. And I love when you talk to children, I think it's very important to tell the, tell the story of how marshmen did work years ago. I think it's very important to keep some of these old things to, to sort of, as I say, to say how people did work. Another tool that's uh, very important on the marsh one of, probably in my opinion, the, probably the, one of the most important tools on the marsh is the marshman. This is absolutely a booty. This is called a hodder to cut out a foot drain. On a dike, say that's your dike, there, and you've got a reed bed there and there, you cut a little insert into the side of the dike so when the water table comes from the river, it pushes into the dike, into the foot drain, flushes your marsh. And when the water goes the other way, the water table go backwards. So you always got to move the water in that little channel. My dear old dad used to call it a grup. The old Norfolk word is a grup. Cutting a grup 
because he used to be a roadman later part of his working life and he let the water off the road and he said I've now got to cut a grub boy <laughs> and get a little insert into the side. <laughs> Certain man I would have a laugh about this one. This is not a Norfolk one actually, this is a West Country one. <laughs> but this is probably one of the important ones on the on the broads. This is one that actually, it's an old peat cutter. But it just shows the children what kind of tool that would, it is. I don't think the Norfolk one's actually got this little step on it. I've been informed that it's a West Country one, but I would find that quite handy. Mm. Just the, it's a peat spade, but not an old one. I think these are 1930s around that area and as I say all the fishermen that went out from Yarmouth probably you have a job to find to actually a pair of leather boots in that quality because the leather is absolutely and the workmanship I should think putting them on on a marsh you need to go them on <laughs> but the strength in there look so they're a pair that I show children who have come to Howe Hill to Howe Hill Trust where I mostly talk and they probably are amazed at People would have wore these kind of things years ago, but good quality boots. Now I know these ones, these would be the winter boots, <coughs> obviously, and these would be the summer boots. Theoretically the water table on the mark doesn't get, these are 1916, and these do actually come from a place where I know a marshman used to wear them. Sadly he's not with us now, but they were leather, leather boots. And I would assume they looked after these boots. They would probably cost them a lot of money going back to them years, especially those, I would assume. But uh, they're nice things to have by you, to do talks. And as I say, I'm always fascinated when I go out and do a talk that people still love to know about marsh, marsh people and marsh things. I'm informed this one is a, a nice one. I'm informed this one's about mid-1800s. I don't, I'm not a great knowledgeable on these, but I do love them because this, again, I would assume probably a marshman would head in that cottage. Illegal to use today. I don't know if I'm right or wrong, I think this one would be used on the end. For what reason, I can't tell you, but this is a, an eel dart, a very collectible dart. And the principal in the little boat up the dog at random and hope you get your dinner on there. And they always reckon that a marshman was better off than the farm worker because he had access to catching eels for food where probably someone on the farm did. And the other one, the other one is a more, a later one. I think about 1900s I would say. About 1900s, same principle again. But I've collected these things. Uh, they are a nice thing to show children mainly why I've collected these things because I, I knew a lot of this stuff was being thrown away. Uh, but there's no plastic on this, it's all lovely, what should I say, nice wooden handle, no plastic rubbish. This is my last day here, I've enjoyed every bit of Howe Hill. I'm not running away from the place, thank the Lord I've uh, got a little job with the Howe Hill Trust at the top uh, to do talks and various other things that uh, David's got in mind and uh, I do appreciate that so I shan't be wrenched from the place in a sense if you, if you know what I mean I had 40 years coming here and, and, and loving every day really